Hi, everybody. Guess what? It's At Skating PJ here with none other than Canadian men's champion Roman Sadowski, one of my all time favorite skaters. You probably don't know this, but Roman, I've been a fan of yours since, hold on, wait for it, wait for it, since you were this guy. I'm back. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So you, I want to find out, as does everybody else, and we're going to take yeah. um, occasional comments and questions as they come in. We're live streaming on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, my PJ Kwong page, as well as on YouTube on my PJ Kwong channel. Um, so make sure you like and subscribe. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And then, um, so I want to know, figure skating, how did you get started? I know it was about hockey, but what made you do the switch? Yeah, um, I mean... I, I it wouldn't be much of a switch to be honest. It was more so I started figure skating and then never really went over to the other side. Okay. Um, so the most part, to skate. it was, yes. Okay. So I was first trying to skate. Actually, the first time I skated wasn't on Learn to Skate. It was on a like a free public session I went with my parents. Okay. And I thought I was pretty good at the time, or at least my parents did, because I didn't really, I wasn't that walking person on the ice. I yeah. just kind of went and just felt the flow right away just sort of mimicked what other people were doing and it worked. And then my parents were thinking, ah, we'll just put him in skating lessons because I was saying, oh, I want to play hockey. And, uh, you know, funny enough, I didn't even want to actually be like an actual hockey player. I wanted to be the goalie. So there wasn't much <laughs> skating involved there, but yeah. So I, I went into the skating lessons and one of the coaches there noticed me and was like, oh, like you should try like figure skating. I guess she saw something in whatever I was doing, <laughs> five-year-old Roman was doing, but she thought, you know what, you should try figure skating. And at first I obviously was like, oh no, that's like, you know, Canadian boy, hockey. So figure skating wasn't really the- The girl sport. Yeah, I didn't want to say it, but- <laughs> it, But it's I had, a little bit think that I way. That, I had that feeling. And after that, I guess they did their own little, you know how you convince little kids to sort of do stuff. Oh, it's like super cool. It's like gonna be awesome. And I was like, let's do it. So I was convinced. And um, yeah, I started skating. And from then on, I never ever even thought about going to hockey. I just loved okay. it so much from that point on that I, it, it wasn't even a thought to my mind, oh, let's go play hockey now. It was just like, this is it. I still did some other sports on the side. So I did uh, swimming and gymnastics. And then I did all three competitively somewhat to some degree at the same time. But then skating always was that really special one. So I stopped doing gymnastics first because if you don't know, gymnastics is like a lot of commitment very quick. So I sort of, uh, not only did I start skating a lot hours per week, but uh, the gymnast coach that I had was like saying, okay, like we want you to dedicate, let's say the full week now on the, in the gym. Wow. Like, as opposed to skating was just like three, four days a week. The gym, they're like, no, no, no. We need you here all day, every day. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't commit, right? So I dropped uh, gymnastics and then swimming was like another thing. It's like two or three times a week. So I was able to multitask, but it was always the thought process was um, how long can I do this? Not really, this is it. Versus skating was always like, this is it. So that's why I always stuck with that. So talk to me a little bit about, so all three of those sports have things in common and things that are different. Obviously, dedication to technique is one of the things that you have in common, um, and they're all sort of solo sports. But talk to me about the idea of figure skating, and let's just go with jumping. How well, did that well, figure into your de decision? Into choosing skating? Yeah. Uh, I mean... I would definitely say it was probably a, a major role. I can't say that without jumps. It, it's sort of like, like if we compare gymnastics and skating, the jumps are sort of the flips, you know what I mean? It's, it's sort of that kind of uh, athletic quality, that um, that difficulty and intricate technique, that's, that's sort of how they were similar. And I don't know why, and it's hard to explain, but skating just sat, felt more enjoyable. I don't know. I felt more satisfied landing difficult jumps than I would be than like doing something on the floor or on the mat in gymnastics. I'm not sure what it was exactly. There's a certain quality about having like a glide after and it just feels so, so flowy for some reason that that really stuck with me more. 
Do you know, it's so interesting because I think the, one of the reasons why I was asking the question about the jumps is we're going to uh, screen your short short film um, in a little bit called Grounded. And uh, there are quite a few shots of you jumping in that. And I wonder mm -hmm. if maybe the glide, as you say, coming out of a jump, if maybe that's part of the attraction. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I think also the thing about figure skating, and maybe you can talk to me a little bit about that, is the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're in gymnastics, um, there are certainly relationships in all sports, so I don't minimize that. But there's something about looking at young people at the boards as they're talking, yeah, they're competitors, but they're also friendly rivals. So can you yeah. talk to me a little bit about that? Um, I think I think it was really awesome, at least, and I'm not sure about other national teams, but the Canadian national team were all really, really close. And they tend to be quite often the same people every year. And even if it's not, we still know everyone at nationals, right? There might be 18 of us, but we know every single person. And it's really not that big. It's because it's such a small world that we have. We're all pretty close. We all keep track of each other's training if we're following each other on social media. And we know what we're all capable of. And we all know everyone's like strengths and weaknesses. And it's pretty interesting watching not only myself, but watching all other people feed off that. And so you have this interest, interesting growth and this interesting, I guess, goal because we all have the same similar goal. And um, I have a lot of pretty close friends. Probably my closest I'd say on a national team is Trent, Michelle. Uh, we've traveled a lot. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's what we need right now. <laughs> um, and all of even even in that picture, I've traveled with all of them in so many countries, and it's it's really cool being able to experience something like that with people who have very similar mindsets, very similar goals. I don't know. It's it's just it's an experience you can't really explain. Is when you go and it's it's a single sport, but even when you go to competition, you still feel like there's a team there with you. Because there is. You yeah, know, it's interesting. I, I did an interview recently with Nam Nguyen, and one of the pictures that I showed him was one actually that I took backstage of he and Keegan um, hugging Elaine, who'd had a, a, a not very good skate mm -hmm. um, at the World Championships. And it was that which, kind of camaraderie. Which, which, which year was that? I want to say a year before last. Okay. So maybe two years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can see the backstage, but of course not the country because I'm only ever buried in a basement, but that's okay. Mm. It's not about me. <laughs> but the idea that um, people all want to win, it's it's that kind of a sport, but the fact that if they can't if they can't win, then they are happy for their friends to do well. This has been a very good season for you. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, national championships. Let's talk about uh, this smiling face that I've seen backstage lots of times. That was actually at an autumn classic. Yeah. Um, so uh, Canadians this year, I mean, your um, uh, free program moved so many people, myself included. Um, it just, is a piece of art. So I'd like you to tell me a little bit about how you come up with that artistic persona on the ice. Well, first of all, thank you. That's a, that's that's the end goal at the end of the day, right? If people are moved, that that's all I need. Yeah. But um, it was a lot of work. There's definitely like everyone sees that end result, and they don't see the whole background work that's in place. Um, I definitely have to credit my choreographers and um, all the people that I work with to actually improve that side of skating for me. Name uh, them because it's nice for them to be named out there in the world. David Wilson, he does most of my short programs, and Mark Pillay, he does most of my long programs. But the good thing is, both of them are actually in constant contact with each other, as well as Tracy and me. So we have this this circle, this team of where we can communicate music ideas, we can communicate choreography ideas, and sort uh, goal setting for stuff like that. Right. So that's that's really really good. And then, um, so when we got the long choreographed, funny enough, that year, I had no idea what I was going to skate to. Um, I was looking around and I had some stuff, but like nothing that really called out to me. And Mark was being a little bit, um, I, don't know, I don't know the right word to explain, but he's being so sec like secretive. So I knew he had something he wanted to offer, but he was like terrified that if he gives it to me that I'd like deny it or something. So I kept waiting for him to send me this music. I'm like, a little scared almost because he's if he's not confident with it <laughs> that I won't like it I wasn't very confident that I would like it either so he's waiting 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 and I think it was maybe two weeks before 
we were planning to choreograph, he sent it to me. I listened to it once. And that was it. Like I texted him back. Like I'm, this is it. Like this is definitely the piece. And what I really, really liked about it was it's Schindler's List, but it's not the classic movie Schindler's List. It's also Bells of Moscow, but it's not the classic Bells of Moscow. So there, yep. it's a really interesting mix put together. And they were both pieces that I really, really loved. But the thing that turned me off about each piece was how uh, popular they were. So because of how like heavily used, I didn't want to use something that was overused per se. But this was really special because of that mix. It was unique. And because of that, I could make the program unique as a result of the music being unique. So in a way, we were trying to make my own version of Schindler's List. If that makes sense because it's so heavily used the only way to differentiate yourself is one the music has to be a little different and two we need to make the skating on on a different level yeah and so that's what we sort of we worked on and um we worked with different jumping orders so different um planned program orders to see what worked for me and constant work with uh i have a off-ice ballet instructor i work with them on the long and short, but we lo we worked really um, hard on that artistic side. And he said something that really, that changed my, I guess, outlook on things. So he, he told me that, he told me to go home. So he gave me like this homework, if you will. And he said, you need to go home and figure out a story that, that you can relate or believe in. And it doesn't have to be a real story, right? You can make it up. But as long, he said, he said, if you don't believe that, the audience won't believe it. Yeah. So that was really like, whoa, like that was sort of really different for me. And once he said that, I, I sort of went home and I um, reflected on the movements that I had and I have to associate each, each movement with either a certain, not memory, but story or emotion. And as long as I can get that imagery in my head, as long as I believe it, then the audience will believe it. So that was sort of the big work on afterwards. You know, it's so interesting. Um, the music complemented the story, obviously. And um, that program has a haunting quality, mm -hmm. um, which just kind of gets you right right in in the feels, all of yeah. the feels. And, and it's different when it's live as opposed to yeah. online. There's yeah. like a certain oh, like yeah. cold, almost like, I don't know, there's a really tense moment there. That's why I prefer people see it live than online, but it's okay. <laughs> If you can only see it online, do that. Yeah. Um, so here's a great comment from Terry Rance, longtime viewer. Um, hi, Terry. Um, she said that you um, are influenced by or you've admired the style of Jeffrey Buttle. Um, yeah. Tell me about the people whose st styles you've admired and why. Uh, a big one. Jeffrey definitely played a big yeah, one. Yeah, no kidding. Probably, honestly. Well, okay, I'll say this. He was an amazing skater. And that's obviously true, but he's also Canadian. <laughs> and so that played a big role for me. He was really good and he was Canadian. That was my idol. So that's who I sort of focused on for a long, long time. And uh, I say this pretty often, I was, and I, I'm gonna apologize in advance, but I was so disappointed when Patrick beat him that one year <laughs> because I wasn't, I, I wasn't quite on board with the Patrick train yet. And so uh, he was sort of climbing up just then and Jeffrey was like, was I guess my vision, you know? And um, I could definitely see that some of it trickled down into, into my skating, but at the same time, I'm still trying my best. I don't wanna copy skaters at the end of the day. I, wanna, I wanted to sort of take pieces or um, ideas from other skaters and eventually make it my own and uh, just make it more original. I don't wanna be a carbon copy of someone else. That's, that's, that's my end goal right now. Yeah, there might be some similarities here and there between some skaters, and and that, that comes from everything, wherever you look, even in art or in dance or basically any art form. There's definitely inspiration from different places, and I think that's totally okay. But I think it's important to definitely maintain some level of originality and sort of you can find inspiration, but it has to be your own at the end of the day. You know, and you are an artist. I mean, Thank I've you. been watching you since you were a little guy, since we were, um, you know, eyeball to eyeball. That hasn't happened in some years, that's for sure. No. <laughs> um, but I think that, and this is really great advice. This is from Joanne Shaw, long time official. Um, and hey, Joanne, um, stay true to yourself. That's that's yeah. all you can do. Yeah. Um, so I wanna know a little bit about, um, 
you know, you you have had some outstanding successes. I mean, you've competed at your Junior Worlds, Junior Grand Prix. Um, you you won um, a medal this year, your first Grand Prix medal at NHK. You've medaled at um, Autumn Classics, uh, not Autumn Classic, the Challenger Series. I didn't know where my brain was going. There I have medaled at Autumn Classic, but. I know, Challenger <laughs> Series. <laughs> Um, and of course now national champion. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about you, who do you want us to see? What are three qualities that you want us to see that are uniquely Roman? <laughs> uniquely Roman. Um, uh, I love jumping, but I okay. don't want to say jumping because that would not be uniquely me. We're all jumping at the end of the day. We're all going there. We all have, some have, I guess, more difficult program content than others, but at the end of the day, it's pretty close as to what like everyone's doing. Um, qualities that I want, lots of flow. I want it to be as, as flowy and um, I'm looking for that word. I can't find it. That's uh, a great word finesse, actually. Finesse, finesse. Okay. Yep. That's that's my word. So number one quality is finesse. Number two, I would say um like emotional connection. Okay. You know what I mean, like a like a like someone said, who did, what do they say that they felt moved or whatever? I want that kind of emotional connection. So finesse, uh, emotional connection. And that was me third, who said I was moved, by the way. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> okay, then the third one is um um memorable there you go wow that's great yeah yeah i want something that's like so you look at it you see the finesse and then you feel emotionally connected and as a result of that you can always remember it you know that is kind of the goal it's really not about i mean it's great to have the medals it's great to have the titles absolutely no, nice. nobody <laughs> would take that away from you it's very um, nice <laughs> it is very nice but at the end of the day, I mean, look at Kurt Browning, no Olympic medal. And yet, and yet, who, you know, we remember him. Okay. Um, and I, I think that it's super, super important. Okay, so I, um, this person, Lori Maisie, is talking about the fact that you're skating and your videos are a ton of fun. Good. We're going to go <laughs> for a moment to the video side because I want to talk to people about uh, the video that you just posted not long ago. First of all, I have complete YouTube numbers envy. I'm going to be honest with you. And secondly, um, you were talking about um, the countdown and your hair and my hair. People yeah. are saying that the, they like your hair. Here's another Thanks. one. Lisa Yamaguchi loves your hair. Um, it's, getting, it's, and, it's getting a little bit much for me, but it's okay. We'll see what happens when we actually get back on the ice. <laughs> Lori Sinclair also likes the hair. So this whole pandemic, let's talk sort of on a more serious note about the pandemic. How has this affected you in your life? And how has this affected your um, ability to think things through, to uh, really process things? Uh, I say it became a little bit of a blur in the past month or so. Um, the beginning was really, really weird. Like if you told me, because for me, I don't know how about anyone else, but we went to Friday the 13th. I remember clearly it was Friday the 13th in March. That's when they told us that all the public facilities in our area are closing. And we're like, that's like bizarre. And I did keep track with the news a little bit. So we did see, I guess, some cases showing up in, um, I guess, in our area. But I I wasn't fully aware. So I had that little bit of ignorance there. I was like, whoa, whoa what? That's so weird. And I knew that some pub, uh, private ranks were still working. So we were trying to, we were scrambling, trying to, to go to some other rank. And then we started realizing, like, whoa, like, everyone's closing. So that's when it started getting a little almost scary and more serious. Um, and the focus wasn't necessarily on training anymore. It was more so like staying safe. And it, it's weird. It's when you go from one goal from going, okay, let's train like crazy. And then the next one, it's like, we have to stay safe. It's like something you can't really prepare for. It's really, really weird. And I guess our thought process at the time was as much off ice as possible. So I just train as much as you can off the ice. But it was... What was the most difficult, I think, was because we didn't have a date back, it was hard to train 
in a way because this could take forever and it's i i compared it one time to like homework in school especially when you do homework as an athlete you procrastinate so much even though you shouldn't maybe it's just me but you always you always set it back and you you're thinking it, like let's say i train all day i come home there's no way that i'm going to be able to put my 100 percent focus on this work right and yet the motivation is not there so you push it back so i almost had some of these days where i was training and because there's no deadline i almost wanted to push back the training and mm -hmm. it's I think it's normal and natural to have some of those days, but it was like, I have days on the ice that are unmotivating, but this was completely on a different level. This is like, I'm just going to stay home and lie in bed all day. So it was definitely really, really difficult in that regard. But I, I mean, I'm trying my best. All I can say is uh, I'm trying my best to keep my cardio up, um, keeping my body strong, because if I don't, I'm, I know I'm going to regret it when I step back on the ice. So that's my main motivation. Is I, yeah. I want to be able to get back on the ice and feel satisfied with that I, I maintained as much as I could and I didn't degrade in any way, if that makes sense. Of course, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's take a quick look because I, I want to turn our attention a little bit to your budding career as a filmmaker. You've mm. made this outstanding film called Grounded. And Thank uh, we're, uh, no thanks to me, my friend. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I love that. I love it. And I want to know about the uh, process for creating that, but we're going to watch it first. Yeah. So let's see. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. My name is Roman Sadovsky and I am a Canadian figure skater. Grounded. That's the first word that comes to my head when I try to describe how I feel about the current situation. What I like most about figure skating is the freedom. The freedom of movement, the freedom of expression, a place where spirit thrives and there isn't anything that can quite replace that for me. And without that, I feel grounded. The feeling of the cold air cutting against my face, the feeling of soaring through the air. There are times where I swear I can feel like I'm detaching myself from this physical world and its limitations and go wherever I want. It's almost psychedelic. Now it's spring, a transition to the new season, a time to look forward to trying new things. Pandemic. A new thing that none of us really anticipated, an obstacle that no athlete could have possibly prepared for. We're built to handle things like our equipment failing or injuries, but this is something completely off the charts, something completely unprecedented. Something that can only be seen under a microscope effectively put the entire world on complete lockdown. Everything's cancelled, everything's closed. After some time, I started to miss more things than just skating. I missed the process of learning. Like many others, I'm also unemployed and I miss the process of teaching and watching others improve. I miss the people that skating connected me to, which understandably makes up most of my social circle, and without a doubt, they are my favorite people. I miss the feeling of satisfaction and validation after a good day of training, and the drive to bring out more when it just doesn't happen sometimes. I just, to put it simply, I miss it all. But the reality is, we won't be grounded forever. We should look ahead, keep our heads up, we fight back. The change in our daily routines and the habits are part of the attack. The best offense is a good defense. We can distract ourselves, indulge in other arts, try new things. This is a good time to reflect on ourselves and work on ourselves so that when the time comes where everything can return to normal, we'll be stronger than ever. I'm sorry, COVID-19, but you're on your way out because frankly, you don't stand a chance against us. <laughs> wow. Great. <laughs> it is just uh, outstanding. Um, I love it. I, I just love everything about it. I want to know 
the moment that the story popped into your head and the um, impetus to to create the film? Okay, so there is this YouTuber that I follow and he just happens to be within the York region. I think he lives in um, Markham, Unionville. Um, his name is Matty Hapoya. He's pretty well known in the sort of, I guess, filmmaking genre on YouTube. Um, he has close to a million subs, so I'm 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 envious wow. of YouTube numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he he released this um, this video, and he said, "Oh, uh, he's gonna hold this little film festival slash contest." And I think first place was two thousand, second place was fifteen hundred, and then uh, third, fourth, fifth was five hundred, five hundred, five hundred. And he said. The, the short film is pretty, anything is fair game. Uh, the theme is pandemic. Cool. He, he gave that vague, really, really vague <laughs> description. And I, I, I sort of watched that video once and then I watched the video a second time, like maybe I could do this, right? Cause I'm not doing anything. <laughs> so it was at that point that I, I sort of had the ideas uh, just going through my head and I took a couple of days to think about it and I guess the idea was just like, just like, just explain what I'm experiencing. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's my experience, the pandemic, everyone's going to be different. And definitely my story is different than other people. So at the end of the day, that was, that was the goals. I'm going to, I'm going to tell them my story and then um, hopefully maybe in some way inspire someone else at the same time. And that was at that point, it just, the ideas just started flowing in. So I sort of had a mental list of shots that I wanted and I sort of wrote out a script within, I don't know, two or three hours. And I think the, t the total, I'd say, production time it took me with writing and editing and shooting probably took me around mm, in the ballpark of like between 40 to 80 hours. I know it's a really bad estimate, but I'd say it's somewhere in that range. So it took quite a bit of time because it was such, such a crunch period. He gave us, I think, two weeks to do it or maybe a week and a half even. So it was like serious crunch time. I'm not used to that kind of thing. I'm used to just sort of doing these YouTube videos for fun. I can shoot them and I can literally edit them over the course of two weeks, which is sometimes what happens. I shoot them and then I procrastinate and it takes me a while to edit. But this was like zone in. I had, of course, my training to do, but at the same time, I had to really amp it up and get it out on time. In the end, I still didn't make the top five. So, oh, well. Oh. <laughs> You made I made top five in my festival, just so you know. That's good. That's good. I, I made the, you know what? I made the top 20 honorable mention though. So that was that's pretty That's amazing. Good. But there were like, there was the exact number was 1,952 submissions worldwide. So that was, that was pretty good. The fact that I even noticed it. I know he, he actually made a video um, reflecting on some of the films. And it's funny. He gave me like a little part of his video. I got a little bit of screen time on there. So it was good. That is amazing. Okay, here's a great comment from Rafael Gonzalez. Cinematography and storytelling skills are amazing. The way Thank that you, you advanced the story was um, uh, wonderful. And I'm somebody, I mean, I can't do what you did, but I love words and I love being able to figure out, it's like a puzzle, you mm -hmm. know, um, because how you structure things and how you order things makes all the difference in terms of the final product of the story. Yeah. So um, uh, how many tries on the back deck with the axle, just asking. How many tries? Um, yeah. Probably 15. Wow. <laughs> I would Bro. say because I'm a terrible, terrible off ice jumper. I've Are never, Me too. ever been good at off ice. <laughs> and I, I just, I don't know, the feeling, especially for axle, I love using that edge on the ice. Yep. And I'm, there's two kinds of axles out there there's the edge axle and there's a skid. Yep. So there are people who just use edge. That's people like uh, me. Um, I think Nam does edge, Yuzu does edge. I think all the Japanese skaters do edge axles. And then um, there's skidding axles, which is like more so European style, if that makes sense. But there's still people yeah. in the States who, who skid also. But I'm an edge uh, jumper. I feel that edge and I rely on it. If I try to re replicate that on the floor, it's impossible. It's like it's, it's yeah. non-existent. So I don't, I never jump off the ice actually. If you ever... The only thing I ever do is I just do a vertical jump and rotation that's as far as my off ice jumps goes. I actually only started doing off ice double axles during this pandemic for that short film. No reason other than that. I wanted the shot 
my main reason I wanted a shot where I jump off the ice, rotate, and then transition into an on ice triple axel. And the reason I wanted that, I just sort of wanted to convey that message of going back on the ice after working on the ice, after being trapped. It's like the whole mental image I wanted to capture was that we sort of break free and then go into what we want. Because at the end I say, you know, you don't stand a chance against us. I think I, something along those lines. Yeah. So yeah. that's sort of what I wanted to reflect. I only started doing off ice axles for that shot and not for the development of my skating at all. So yeah. That's amazing. Listen, a great question coming from uh, YouTube this time, my kombucha. Um, what program or event of yours should I watch to get to know you? First of all, go to Romsky, his YouTube channel, because there's lots of revealing information there yes. <laughs> about <laughs> all kinds of YouTube stuff, which is really kind of cool. But what is your yeah. favorite event so far? I'm going to say, if you want to know my skating the most, I would say NHK this year, or 2019, rather. Yeah. That was for me. Of course, Nationals was awesome. So getting the title, that was amazing. The skate wasn't flawless. But it was strong. You see that that's my face at NHK. That's how you know I was impressed with myself. <laughs> Very pleased. Um, Autumn Classic was really good too, but still wasn't. Autumn Classic, I'd say, was my my first sort of feeling that like I'm improving. I had a little bit of a struggle here and there as I was growing, and my consistency, even even now, is not ideal or not where I want it to be. But it's definitely getting better. And NHK was at moment that long program was like that this, moment like this is how i practice that's what i did in, in the competition that was that moment where i'm like practicing is worth it because up until then it was like i would be training amazing and sometimes it just wouldn't reflect in competition and that was that moment even nationals was also sort of that moment where like my training is paying off like it's not it's not all for nothing you know what i mean so, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this person. You are uh, trained by Tracy Wayman and Gregor Filipowski. Yeah. So this is Tracy. Um, let's talk about your relationship with your coaches and how that has helped your career. I've been training with Tracy and Gregor since I was, I'm going to say, eight years old. I think that's the first time. Since you were that guy. A little younger than that, but yeah, <laughs> I think I think I'm around twelve then. Okay, I think that's twelve year old. I was a late bloomer when I was growing. I didn't. I actually didn't start growing until I was around fourteen, fifteen, and then I the growth spurs continued until I was about sixteen, seventeen. But yeah, I, I first was acquainted with them when I was around eight years old. So I, I started skating in Mississauga with uh, Alan and Linda Carson, and. I sort of just sort of was doing part-time in Mississauga and I did like one day a week with Tracy and Gregor. That was just the most that we could dedicate at the time. And I sort of was really liking it and sort of slowly transitioned to go full-time with Tracy and Gregor. And I think it was full-time maybe when I was nine years old. I mean, these are, these are rough numbers, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I was around eight or nine. We eventually transitioned. Um, I moved closer to the rink just for skating. Um, honestly, over the years, I've grown really, really close with both Tracy and Gregor. Uh, I'm very well, I don't know, like I'm, I'm really, like I, I feel really deeply connected with that club now because of how long I've been there. Uh, my involvement, I think, is like a lot. There's a lot of involvement there. And it's really cool. It's a. I like the facility. The facility is awesome. We're we're getting a brand new rink next next door to where I was usually training, and the facility is awesome. The people are awesome, and just the the training time with Tracy and Gregor was was great. Like really really good. Um, Tracy had a lot of experience. Uh, she was known. She was Canadian champion when she was twelve years old, if I'm not incorrect. She was a baby. Yeah. She was, she was 12 years old. She had, uh, she was Canadian champion went to worlds back when that, when that was allowed when you're 12 and then she kind of wasn't completely like around until she was 18. So that's when she won her second Canadian title. So she has a lot of experience going through different changes in life with skating and different changes with your body and skating. And I think, that experience really helped me because when I was 
like you saw that picture guys like you, you <laughs> that was me before this is me now a lot has changed so that whole time me growing it was definitely struggling to go through that and I, I feel that i was fortunate enough to have a good team surrounded around me to help deal with that growth and that's that only just strengthens your bond with your coach in the end of the day so yeah we're really close now and it's uh i have definitely a good time training with them day to day you know it's interesting when you look at the relationship with the coaches and the relationship to the sport um give me one or two of the biggest lessons that skating and your coaching team have taught you uh i think my my coaching team and i hate it like i hate it so much but they kept reinforcing this idea of patience but like come on like what, what do i need patience for right <laughs> Um, that was their big thing is I, I always wanted to, I guess, jump the gun. Like I was always in a rush to do these new things and they were sort of holding me back all the time. Um, and for good reason, there, like, there were things that I shouldn't have been doing and there's a good thing I wasn't because if, if I had that same ambitious thing, uh, like mentality, I'd be throwing in jumps into my program that I'm not at all ready for. <laughs> so it's a good thing that I have them to hold me back and, reinforce this idea of, of patience and um, they sort of help develop a, a smart training strategy, right? There's training hard and I always felt that I was a hard worker and, and um, there was, there's a fine line between training hard and training smart. I still to this day, I kind of struggle with that. Sometimes I go way too far with training and then I obsess over things that I don't need to be obsessing over and having that team with me. They definitely taught me to train better and I'm still not great at it. <laughs> uh, they definitely hold me back and they remind me like, it's okay. Like if something doesn't work, there's no need to do like 20 quad toe loops if it's not working today. And I, it feels so necessary to me in that moment. So I'm in, I'm, I have a 45 minute session and I'm getting riled up and frustrated that my quad toe's not working. Nothing feels more right than to do another 30 of them. And then, then I need, that's when I need that, like that person to hold me back. And then later when I get off the ice, I'm like, you know what, why did I need to, like, I don't need to do that. Right. The realization comes after, but it's, they definitely helped me, I guess, get that realization sooner. And if I can't, they, they pull, pull me back sooner. That was really good. Oh, I was just going to ask you one yeah. quick question. Um, are you one of those skaters who feels that the jumps kind of externally drop into you via the uh, uh, jump god? Or are you one of those skaters who feels like the jump is within me and I just have to adjust, you know, my shoulders or uh, for some reason today it's not working? Like, where do you sit on that? There's a lot of magical thinking in figure skating. People don't right. always realize that the jump belongs to them. They somehow feel that the jump god is the one who's saying, nope. Today is your quad toe day. So You're, where are you on that? Uh, <laughs> honestly, I'm, I, I look at it this way. I think about developing jumps. It's in your control more so. So for example, when I was first learning quad toe, let's say that was, that was the latest quad that I landed after Sal. I landed it when I was 18, I'm going to say 17, 18. And Training it, I feel in control. So I feel like, okay, I'm trying whatever, let's say shoulders, or I need to check more, or if I need to stay committed longer to the end. So stuff like that, I feel in control of. I feel it's once you have the jump, once it's yours, the gods start to play with you. And it's a real thing. I'm telling you, it's a very real thing. Sometimes the gods are just like, no, Roman, today, you don't have the allowance you have an not allowance of, of you have no allowance today of any quad toes it's not happening so it's it's definitely a really weird thing and there are things that you can't explain it could be fatigue it could be mental fatigue it could be physical fatigue through a week um and sometimes you know what i'll take a break i won't do any quad toes for three days Th after the three days is over I, i'll try the first one and nail it hmm. how, do you, how do you explain that you don't it's the, jump the jumping jump. gods <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of that 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 quest to somehow be in good relations with the jump gods when you go into competition, whether the jump gods are in your head 
or whether they're in the sky, wherever they are, you need to find a way to just be on good terms with them when you need them. And that's your competition. Yeah. Yes, that's the <laughs> ideal, ideal moment. So I want to know, um, you've got lots of young viewers who are watching this today. Um, you've had your fair share of struggles having to walk through the mix zone, talking to people like me, and you've had your fair share of successes. Right. So what sorts of strategies can you offer to a skater who's had a terrible competition? Is there something that makes you believe that the sun's going to come out tomorrow? Which, of course, it does. <sighs> um... This and is for me. The victory sweeter, I meant to say yeah. as well. <laughs> I, um, for me personally, I get very, I get like intense disappointment emotions, but they don't last very long. And that's just, a, that's, a, that's a personal thing. I'll be like devastated for maybe honestly, sometimes for like a couple hours, I swear. And then I'm just like, wow. Like, that was dumb. Why did I do that? And then I sort of just move on. And I know people are different, but for some reason, I, I do feel that way. And the biggest thing is I sort of, I focus when you look at it as a whole, like, right? There's disappointment in one competition. But then when I look at a season and I'm like, wow, like that season wasn't what I wanted to be. I sort of just focus on whatever performances were just great. So let's talk about 2018 2019 season that was i felt my first competition of the season was autumn classic really good strong performance not perfect but strong performance personal best skate uh personal best score rather there you go that day. That, that day that day right there over the moon yep i don't think anything good happened after that competition for the rest of the season yeah, nothing. Sorry, I phrased that wrong. Nothing good happened after the season. No, yep. nothing good happened after that competition for the rest of the season. I think I phrased that right. I don't in know. terms of results, you mean? <sighs> in terms of skating, I was doing okay. weird mistakes, like really, really weird mistakes. Um, skate, I had Skate Canada that year. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but it was not what I wanted at all. Yep. Especially yep. when I consider training. Um, I had another international then. The long program was very, it was a struggle. Um, the nationals, training into nationals was really good. I'll say that. So I was training yep. really well going into that nationals. I was already sort of thinking, okay, podium opportunities, um, yep. competition yep. opportunities. Yep. I was sec. I don't remember. I was, I was maybe third or fourth, maybe second out of the short. I don't remember. Third. I think you third, were third. third. But I was like, yep. let's say seven points away from first. Or yep. something. It was pretty close. It was similar to last year or this this last year, right? I was in third in the short and I wasn't that far off from first. So I had that same situation and the long just really didn't it didn't come together. So so if I reflect on that, or when I reflected on that season, I looked at it and I'm like, wow, Autumn Classic, which was the first one, was the only one that was good. And it was sort of like, whoop, and then it was sort of a trickle down. And I I felt I I after that nationals, I was that one I was disappointed for longer because I was training well. And it was one of those moments where I was thinking like, wow, what's the point of training well if you can't do it when you need to? And it sort of was a really weird, it was a weird couple of weeks. And I just decided, you know what? I want to focus on what I did at Autumn Classic, really. So if I did it before, I can do it again at some point. For right? sure. So I, I decided, you know what? My training throughout 2018 and 19 was good. So I'm like, okay, you know what? We're going to keep the programs. We're going to build on top of that 2018 uh, to 19 season. We're going to build on top, continue that good training. Because I figured, you know what? Maybe just wasn't enough time. So that was sort of the, the, the whole point was we need more time. We need more mileage. And that's sort of what I trusted in. At the end of the day, I'm like, let's just build on top of it and keep going. And then this season, um, the same thing. I had really good events. And then not so good events. But... It was way better than the year before. If the happened. highs were high. Yeah, the highs sure. were higher and the lows yep. were higher. Much higher. Yep. I've had some pretty bad lows in the previous season. So, yeah, overall, I'd say definitely improved based on that. I used that foundation that I got in that training foundation that I got from 2018, 19, 19, 20, built on top, just relied on that. And that's, I guess, if I'm going to say, if I'm going to give anyone advice, my coaches always say, but patience, right? You need to focus on 
the good stuff that happened and then just you need to really believe that it can happen again and if it's not then then maybe it's later maybe it's maybe it's in a year maybe it's in two yep. you just gotta focus on training then work from there hang in there okay here's my final question you're going to be excited that we're coming to an end here but you have been outstanding <laughs> i can't wait I know to you get off this right now <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. Um, I know um, that you have a birthday at the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Twenty-one years old. Yeah. And I I'm officially know. legal in the states. I'm not <laughs> going there anywhere. I'm not going anytime soon. But yeah, I was going to say nobody is. I'm are officially are, but that's legal okay. in the states. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am too. Look, another thing we have in common. Let's go. <laughs> um, so I want to know. Let's double that. Let's double your age. Where are you headed in your life? Like skating, is it is skating your lifelong thing? You mentioned coaching. Wow. You mentioned coaching. Where are you? Are you headed down the filmmaking path? Are you heading down to the writing path? Tell me what you are kind of aiming towards. It's all going to change. But just at this point, almost 21, what does that look like? You know what? I'll give you props because I've had so many interviews so much experience with relatively similar questions. Not once has anyone asked me, double your age, what's yeah. happening? <laughs> Not I, I once. To different. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that is an in, like interesting question. I definitely think I could never leave the whole skating world behind. That that's there's so much investment in it. There's there's definitely there will not be a skating world without Roman in it. <laughs> I think That's wonderful. <laughs> at yeah. least to, to some degree, there's some degree I have to be in there. Um, I do enjoy coaching. I am coaching, I would say part-time, even though I do spend quite a bit of hours, but I am technically, if we count the hours, I am a part-time coach, part-time skater. Um, I do enjoy skating. I, I enjoy, like I said in the film, like I, I enjoy watching others improve. I enjoy being able to, I guess, it's almost like it's satisfying watching someone do something when you were sort of facilitating it if that yep. makes sense and watching someone it's a it's a complete different perspective because i have the perspective of being a skater and trying your best and trying different things and trying to land these jumps but then as a coach you look at it in a completely different perspective you're looking at um like you're looking at you're focusing more on timelines and what are better methods and at what time should they be doing this and what time should they be doing that and then having those two different perspectives that I can have now that I'm skating, it's like, okay, now I start to bring more coaching mentalities as I train. And I think that that actually helps me in a way. Um, but yeah, I really like that new coaching perspective and I, I would like watching others develop. So if I'm double my age, like I think I have a lot of experience at that point, who knows what I've been doing throughout my the rest of my skating career. I can almost... You know what? No, I can promise you I'm not competing, but I'm going to be 42. <laughs> so I would say it, it'd be awesome being able to use whatever experience I, I got and, and sharing it with someone else. And in terms of filmmaking roots, I don't know. That's sort of like, it's a very competitive place to be. Yep. Um, I do enjoy you doing the whole YouTube thing. Part of me was thinking, like, what if I could, like, hook up a job in Skate Canada somewhere, someone in the media or something? That'd be pretty cool. Um, I don't know. There's that. That's a very open door thing with skating. I, I'm pretty confident it, it'd probably be more in the coaching route if I were to stick around in the skating uh, scene. The filmmaking route, it opens up a lot of other opportunities that I really can't even imagine. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what? We couldn't imagine COVID-19. In You're right. Dream, you know what? You're right. Uh, I've got an imagination that goes for days. You do too. And it's like <laughs> if somebody had said to me, I would be going on three months inside yeah. my house. But you know what? With every closed door comes an interesting opportunity, like being able to talk to skaters like you uh, twice a week. How exciting! How excited am I to be able to do this? <laughs> So you just Good don't you know. know. <laughs> you just don't know. Listen, my friend, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to thank me you. and to answer the questions and comments. Uh, for everybody out there, make sure you go to Romsky 
uh, YouTube channel. That's Roman's uh, yeah. YouTube channel. Make sure you follow him on Instagram, Roman underscore Sadowski, and on Twitter at underscore Roman Sadowski. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but make sure you subscribe to that channel. I know I already have. And um, as I told you before, I have great YouTube numbers envy, but that's okay. I'll get over it. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, you just keep doing what you do best, which is um, uh, inspiring all of us. And Roman Sadowski, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time. I really thank appreciate you. it. Thank See you. you again. Bye.